First of all, we're going to read some scripture together. So would you all stand to your feet with me? And we're going to read a scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And, and let's read together out loud. Let's read with enthusiasm. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. That's what we're going to do. We're going to eat bread. We're going to drink from the cup. Let's pray. Father, we just rejoice to be here together as your family, as your children, as your people, as your church, that we can proclaim through our actions today what it means to truly belong to you. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would let us know of his presence and the Holy Spirit would open our minds for understanding and open our hearts to worship by participating. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats again. This morning, I'm going to give you a little bit of a test. You're going to have to participate with me in this. So we all get a chance to participate together. If your kids are here with you, make sure you include them, because I'm going to ask you three questions, and I want you to think about those questions, and then I'm going to have to ask you to share the answers to some of those questions with some of the people near me, near you. There's nobody near me. And, oh, I need to warn you. Uh, some of you know I had kind of a health problem when I was in the States. I had what's called a DVT, a deep vein thrombosis, and the blood, the, the, the one major vein in my leg is all blocked up. And so I'm taking medication for that. And I have to take the medication at 6 o'clock in the morning and 6 o'clock in the evening. And the medication makes me a little goofy. Do you understand? Goofy? Yeah. Makes me a little bit kind of out there. And I had my medication this morning. So if you're thinking, well, Pastor Dave's acting a little weird today, yes, I am. And I'm joyfully acting a little weird. You just have to put up with it. It's not my fault. I just had to take some medicine. And so, uh, you know, we're okay with that. All right. So these are the three questions you're going to ask. I'm going to share the questions with you. I want you to think about it, and then I'm going to have you share it with the people around you. Okay. In your family, or if maybe if your family is not the most important social group you were a part of, maybe it's a larger family or something like that, what are the most important times in a year for your family? What are the most important times? I have some suggestions. It might be birthdays. It might be anniversaries. It might be Christmas, New Year, Lunar New Year, Chinese New Year, a different kinds of celebrations, school holidays, all these things. What are the most important times for your family? That's the first thing I want you to think of. Think of one or two different answers for that. Secondly, how is that time celebrated? What do you do in your family to celebrate that? Is it, are there gifts given to others? Are there songs that are sung? Are there certain prayers or religious activities? Do you visit other people? Do you go to other places? Uh, do you need to get with, together with the older or younger members of their family? Do you go to some kind of religious activity? How do you celebrate that special one? And thirdly, is there a meal involved? What kind of meal is it and what role does it play? All right, everybody thought that through? Got your answers? Anybody out there? Man, I don't know. You all needed to have some of my medicine this morning. I'll tell you that for sure. All right, everybody stand to your feet. Come on. I can see people texting their friends. It's one of those participation Sundays. Don't come. Yeah. All right, I want you to take a couple of minutes and share with some of the people who are around you the answers to the things that we just thought of, okay? What is a special celebration for your family? How is it celebrated? And is there a meal involved? Okay, find some people nearby you. You're going to need to know the people nearby you for participating later, so go ahead. All right, I need your answers, okay? What are some of the important times for families? What, what answers did you get? Just go ahead and yell out. It's okay. Any, sorry? Christmas. All right. How many said Christmas? All right, what else? New Year's and Lunar New Year's and Chinese New Year, right? 
Yeah, like last night, nobody was willing to say Chinese New Year. I thought, come on, let's be honest here, yeah? All right, all right, any others? Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving. right, right. Thanksgiving, if you're an American, used to be the only good holiday. Then they added Black Friday and it commercialized everything, sadly enough. Yeah, that was too bad. Any others? Birthdays? Did anybody say weddings before I said it? All right, what, what was that in the back? Anniversaries, very important. Men especially, don't forget your anniversary. All right. Any others? Summer break, break, yes. Especially for people with kids, very, very important. All right, good, good. How do you celebrate these events? Different ways of celebrating. Eating. Any others? Decorating, what else? Praying, all right. How many of you go someplace on a special family day? How many of you do? Special family day, you're supposed to go someplace. Yeah. How about visiting the, the, the elders of your family, the old people of your family? Yeah, yeah, or the young people, like get little red packets full of money and stuff like that, yeah. yeah. Any, other, any other ways of celebrating that were mentioned? All right, birthdays, that involves cakes and singing, right? Lit candles. All right, let me ask you this final question. Is there a meal involved in your major family events? Overwhelmingly meals involved, right? Special kind of food, special kind of decoration, special kind of sitting around, everybody pretending like they like each other, even their weird uncle or aunt to sit at the table and everybody pretends like they're okay. And meals are really, really, really important, right? I'm convinced that the God who made us, the God who made us, created us within us certain kinds of things. I used to be, when I was younger, I used to be really critical of music that was not spiritual music. As a young pastor, I listened to Christian music. I didn't want to listen to other kinds of music, except for Bruce Springsteen, of course. And, you know, I, I, I thought it was really, really important that, that as Christians, we filled ourselves with Christian music. And then I fell in love with my wife. And all of the romantic songs took on new meaning, took on new understanding, you know. And I saw them all in a different way. And I realized that God created music in a way that would stir up and link with our emotions. That's the way he created us. That's why most places, most contexts of worship of God include music because he made us that way. Music expresses things. Music is easier for us to memorize. You probably know the lyrics to hundreds of songs and you don't know the, you don't know the, the rhyme to hundreds of poems, right? If I start a tune, you could probably sing along and finish the tune if it's a song that you know. Of course, if I know the song, you probably are all too young to know the song. But anyway, that's another thing. And I'm also convinced that God created us with some kind of a capacity to understand that sharing a meal together brings apart or brings together some kind of a closeness that's otherwise missing. I, I really was really astonished when I was living, I was living in Hong Kong towards the end of the 70s and the early 80s when it became possible for people who had left Hong Kong after the Cultural Revolution, largely many of them because they were foreigners, were allowed to go back in, especially in the Christian community, and meet with their brothers and sisters that they hadn't seen, brothers and sisters in Christ, for many, 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 many years. And the most interesting thing to me was that the number one question that people asked was, when you went there to see them, were you able to share a meal together? Because you and I are talking about a meal today. Now, over the years and over the traditions of the church, the sitting together at the Lord's table and sharing a meal together has taken on many important symbolic meanings. And depending on what branch of the Christian church you're from, there are many additional things that have come to it, and those are all wonderful things. But when we read the story of the Lord's Supper from the Bible, we'll discover it was very much a meal that they took together. 
This is a little bit complicated for us because in our modern world, we don't think of a meal as being an act of worship. We don't think of eating as being an act of worship. We think of uh, act of worship as you guys all sitting in a row and listening to me talk. People say, oh, I worship God by going to church. We think of an act of worship of singing songs. We think of an act of worship of praying. We think of an act of worship of reading our Bible. We might even think of an act of worship of making music with musical instruments or, or even giving of offerings. We think of all of them as an act of worship. But it's important for us to understand that 2,000 years ago, and in fact even earlier, God had let his people know that they could worship him by having a meal. You see, Pastor Dave, are you sure about that? I'm very sure about it. Let me take you back a little bit and, and, and remind you of what the spiritual life of the Israelites, God's people when he put them into the promised land was. They had three great festivals, three great feasts in a year. One was called Passover, and it commemorated a time when God protected his people. One was called Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks. It came after the Passover, and it was seven sevens later. So a week of weeks, seven days, seven days, seven days, and then the day after that, we call it Pentecost because penta means 50, Pentecost 50 days. And then there was a Feast of Tabernacle. Now, every Israeli person living in the land of Israel three times a year would go up for Passover, Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. And the interesting thing is these things were all in the spring and they all had something to do with God's provision. So the Feast of, of, uh, the feast of Passover included what's called the Feast of First Fruits, and it celebrated the barley harvest. Barley is a grain and for many of the people during the time of Jesus it was the poor man's grain. Uh, Wheat was more expensive, but barley was something that everybody could make food out of. And when they went up for Passover, they celebrated the barley harvest, and they brought barley with them from their crops. When they celebrated the Feast of Weeks, it was a celebration of the wheat harvest, and they brought wheat with them, and they presented wheat in the temple. When they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles, they brought the first fruit of the olives and the first fruit of the grapes. Now, in all three festivals... They did something else. They brought animals. And they brought the animals and the things that they had gathered together. They were thanking God for he had provided. And so they were returning to God part of what he had provided. Barley, wheat, grapes, and olives. And, of course, the animals that they raised. They had been healthy and they had had had, uh, offspring. They had had lambs and, and so on and so forth. And then they brought those things into the temple. The meat, the animals had been slaughtered and the meat was brought in and it was burned partly because that was a symbol that it wasn't going to be used by anybody else. It was just for God, so it was destroyed. And then part of it was given over to the priests in the temple and that's how the priests had food to eat. And then the rest of it was taken by the people who brought it and they went back out of the temple and they ate it with their friends and with their family. In fact, it's been said that the Feast of Tabernacles was the most popular feast because it was really God's giant barbecue. There were 5,000 priests who had to be on duty to cook all the goats and all the lambs and all the meat that had been brought in and share it. And God's people sang and they danced and they ate and they rejoiced. And this went on on all three festivals. And they knew they were gathered in God's house They were eating a meal that that God had provided for them and that God had participated in that meal with them. And then they were rejoicing and praising him by also eating in that meal. So God, we're eating what you provided and so we're rejoicing and thanking you for your provision. Now, it is against that background that we want to understand the dinner that Jesus had with his disciples. It took, time, it took place during the Passover, during one of the three most important festivals at all. It's almost as if God was saying to them, okay, in the past, three times a year, you came to my house and ate, but now I'm going to show you a way you can eat with me, worship with me all the time. You see, before when the temple was there, they knew that the the Holy of Holies was the place where God was and they could go there to meet him. But through Jesus, God was saying, no, now instead of you coming to me, I'm going to you. I will be with you always. You will always be my people no matter where you are. This is what the Lord's table is all about. We know that Jesus gathered his disciples. He shared the bread with them. He shared the wine with them. 
He told them, whenever you eat this and do this, you remember me, you proclaim me, and when you gather together for a meal, this is what we're going to do together. So today, we're going to learn five important lessons that the Lord's table tells us. Later, we'll participate in the Lord's table, and as we participate, I want you to remember these five important lessons. Let me take you through these lessons. Lesson number one. When we eat at the Lord's table, we are reminded of what kind of people God wants us to be. God wants us to be like Jesus. God wants us to be like Jesus. Now, the first passage that I'm going to read to you comes from John chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. Now, John, who wrote the Gospel of John, is John who is the disciple of Jesus. Many people believe, for good reason, that he was probably a little bit younger than most of the other disciples. And that's why he lived up until he was about probably in the 80s of of his own age and lived about till about 80, 90, and even older. He wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote the Revelation. And many scholars, most scholars believe he wrote John 1, 2, and 3 as well. Now, you have to ask yourself the question. If you read John's story, his Gospel, his story about Jesus, he doesn't tell us about the meal that Jesus took the bread and he broke it, that Jesus took the cup and he prayed for it, that he said, this is my body, this is my cup. He didn't tell us that part, but he did tell us something else about that meal. And the question we might want to ask is, why do you think he told us another part? Have you ever heard a story from somebody? And when you were hearing the story, you thought you knew what was going on until you heard the story from somebody else who was there but saw it from a different perspective? not a contrary perspective. They didn't disagree. They just said, well, it's important for you to know this as well. And that's what John does. Let me read this to you. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper. The devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything, and he had come from God and would return to God. All right, catch this. Jesus knows that Judas is going to betray him, right? He also knows that he has authority from God the Father. How do most people respond to authority? What do they do? They exercise authority, right? Now think about it for a moment. There's Judas. He's been with you for three years. He's already decided to betray you. And now you are absolutely confident that all authority is given to you. What do you do with Judas? You scold him. You throw him out. You punish him, right? Come on, be honest. Aren't we a little bit like that? What does Jesus do? Wanting to show his disciples that he loved them, and he loved them to the very end. He took off his jacket put a towel around his waist, and he washed their feet, including Judas. Why? John tells us that story because he doesn't want us to misunderstand that Jesus loved his disciples. They received his love, and that's what God wants us to be. He wants us to be like Jesus. That's the first thing that we need to remember when we take the communion. Secondly, When we eat at the Lord's table, we're supposed to realize that Jesus is there with us. It is his table and his meal. Now, there would be a tendency for us to think, here we are in this IES place, and we're going to take communion together. We have our communion elements over in the back, and in a few minutes, we're going to have this ceremony together. And so we're here, so we need to ask, Jesus, come and be with us while we worship you, right? Wrong. We're not asking him to be here. He's asking us to join him. It's his meal. It's his table. It's his celebration that we join. And it's important that we have that perspective and that we have that understanding. What does it say in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 15 through 18? You are reasonable people. Decide for yourself if what I'm saying is true. When we bless the cup at the Lord's table... Aren't we sharing in the blood of Christ? When we break the bread, aren't we sharing in the body of Christ? Though we are many, we all eat from one loaf of bread, showing that we are one body. Think about the people of Israel. Weren't they united by eating the sacrifices at the altar? 
So when we come together and share the Lord's table, that's why I like to call it the Lord's table, because I want to be reminded he's here. It is in gathering at his table that we are united together as his people. This event, this celebration, this act of worship belongs to him, not us. Number three, when we eat at the Lord's table, we are supposed to remember what Jesus did for us. Now, this is the central theme of, of symbolism that we find in this, in this event. And it's probably what is emphasized most of the time when we take the Lord's table together. And that's good. That's fine. It's important for us. Paul describes to us in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 this. He said, for I pass on to you what I received from the Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and he gave thanks. And he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after wine, after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant between God in agreement with this. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you announce my death. Or, or Paul says, you announce the Lord's death until the Lord comes again. The lesson that we learn in this is we remember what Jesus did for us. That he gave himself up. He gave us his life so that we could become his people. You know, sometimes I wonder what it was like for the disciples on that first time that they gathered together at the table and Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body for you. And I wonder if some of them didn't whisper to one another, what do you think he means by that? Because Jesus' body was sitting right there. They, 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 were, they were, you know, he was in between them. He was in between uh, John and Judas. He was right there. Now, I know you're saying, well, Pastor Dave, I've seen Michelangelo's picture, and that's not the way it works. Michelangelo was guessing. He had it wrong, okay? Read the story. You'll understand who was sitting next to who. Well, what does he mean, this is my body? What does he mean, this is my blood? Then, when Jesus died and was raised from the dead, they understood. So by the time Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, and he writes that letter around 53 AD, by the time he writes it, everybody in the church understands what this is all about. When we take the Lord's table together in a few minutes, we're going to remember that Jesus died for us so that we could become reconciled to the Father. Number four, when we eat at the Lord's table, we're supposed to treat each other like family. This is really important. Paul says this, and this was a problem in the Corinthian church. He says this later in verse 11. He says, anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of God uh, of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread and drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ. So let me ask you a question. Who's the body of Christ? It's not a trick question. Who's the body of Christ? We are. The church, we're the body of Christ. He said, if we eat the bread and drink the cup, if we rejoice in what God's done without honoring the body, we actually eat and drink judgment on ourselves. Now, let me tell you folks, this may be the easiest place for us to realize what God did for us because we all have families. And when you gather together with your family, everybody there who's in the family belongs. Now, most people have somebody in their family who's a little bit well, let me just put it this way. If they were in the Ganap Ganjil, they would always be on the odd side of the thing. You understand what I say? Everybody has a person in their family who's just, you know, you know, they're there, they belong there, but, you know, if there's no fight, they'll start a fight. If, if everybody's getting along well, they'll say something to discourage everybody. I mean, they're just, you know, like that. And yet they belong because they're part of the family. You pick your friends, you pick your school, you pick your job, you pick your neighbors, but you can't pick your family, your siblings, your relatives, your parents, your children. They are who they are. They belong to you. And that's the only other place where that's true is in the body of Christ. We don't pick who follows Jesus, but when they follow Jesus, they belong to us. It's important that we remember that. The, first, the fourth thing that we understand it's important that we understand that when we gather together, we are family to each other. And then the fifth thing is this. When we eat at the Lord's table, not only are we telling everybody on the inside of the table that we are, belong to each other, we're telling everybody on the outside of the table that we belong to God. The Bible says, every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, 
you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. In other words, when we take communion in a few moments, you're saying, I belong to God. I belong to his family. Let me go over these five things again real quickly. Number one, when we eat the Lord's table, we're reminded of what kind of people God wants us to be. What does he want us to be? Powerful, effective, famous. No, he wants us to be like Jesus. Number two, when we eat at the Lord's table, we're supposed to realize that Jesus is there with us. It's not our table. It's his table. He's the one who's invited us. It's his meal. Number three, when we eat at the Lord's table, we're supposed to remember what Jesus did for us. We're only there because Jesus died and God raised him from the dead. Number four, when we eat at the Lord's table, we treat everybody else at the table as our brother and our sister. Number five, when we eat at the Lord's table, we are telling those who are outside that we're part of God's family. 